Hello, everybody. Welcome into our July webinar. This is Stacy Elliott. I'm here with Marina Jaget. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to start off the webinar and then Marina will finish it off. Uh, we're both um, here at RioSense. We work in the R&D applications group. So today, what we want to talk about are the services that we offer here at RioSense for sample testing and consulting. Um, our main you know, objective is to provide viscometers for you to use in your lab. Um, however, we understand that sometimes you need either consulting services to help you out to better use your instruments or um, you know, sample testing services beyond what you can do in-house. So that's what we wanted to talk to um, you about today. So just a quick overview of what the presentation will be um, composed of. First, we're gonna start, talk about uh, viscosity and our particular technology so you, that you can understand what we're measuring for you and how we're measuring it. And then we'll go into some of the standard options that exist for both the measurements and analysis. We'll talk a bit more about what the consulting services, consulting services consist of, and then also give you a couple examples um, just to sort of clarify um, what we mean by consulting. And then finally, I'll turn it over to Marina and she'll finish things off by discussing the logistics of getting sample testing done. So basically, how do you initiate that and what is the final product that we offer to you in terms of data and reporting? So first off then, and let me just quickly, before I uh, go any further, double check and make sure there are no comments in the chat. Um, sometimes we have technical difficulties when we start and I don't wanna go too far in without confirming. Okay. Um, okay, everything looks good. So uh, our technology is referred to as viscometer rheometer on a chip. So VROC, that's what this stands for. Basically, it's just a combination of a microfluidic channel and MEMS or microelectromechanical sensors. So a bit different than what you may be familiar with if you're more um, used to working with rotational instruments. So what we have then is uh, this microfluidic flow channel and these sensors along the base of the flow channel. And our particular, particular instruments, all of our instruments, um, contain this technology. This is our core technology. So when you get to... Um, uh, when we get to Marina's section where she discusses the different instruments that we may use to test your samples, um, bear in mind that uh, although we have different instruments because they um, have different advantages, our core technology is um, consistent throughout. Um, and our type of instruments are what we refer to as controlled strain or controlled rate. So this means that we are controlling the flow rate through the flow channel and we're then monitoring the pressure. So how does this work in terms of viscosity? So we can relate this volumetric flow rate and then the channel dimensions, um, width and channel depth or height, um, to get us the uh, shear rate. And the stress comes from, um, is calculated from that pressure drop that we monitor across the channel. So as we force fluid to flow through the microfluidics, we see the pressure drop in a linear fashion across the four pressure sensors. And we use this pressure gradient uh, again, in combination with channel dimensions to give us the stress. So we know that viscosity is defined as a stress response to a particular type, type of deformation. So in this case, it's the proportionality between shear stress and shear rate, um, and that gives us the steady shear viscosity. So this is probably the most common type of, uh, when people say viscosity, this is without any further description, this is generally what they mean. And this is also probably our most popular type of testing that we do. However, we also offer the opportunity for extensional viscosity testing. So this is what we refer to as our EVROC um, flow channels, which is just extensional viscometer rheometer on a chip. Um, everything else is uh, pretty much the same with the exception of the geometry of the flow channel. So the standard steady shear viscosity is obtained using a uniform channel, but the extensional viscosity is obtained by introducing what we refer to as a hyperbolic contraction expansion in the center of the channel, which is what we're looking at here with this image. So when you think about getting a different type of viscosity, so we just discussed steady shear, now we're discussing extensional. The difference in this particular case is really what type of deformation are we imposing and what type of stress response um, comes from that deformation. So it, uh, let's think about you know, how this is giving us a different type of deformation. So if, we, if we're introducing the fluid into this contraction zone, 
what we can see is that if you think about you know volumetric flow rate which is what we're controlling here just like in the uniform channel but now that we have this change in cross-sectional area um, because flow rates must be uh, consistent as uh, cross-sectional area decreases linear velocity in this zone must increase so now um, as we enter the zone our velocity along the flow path is constant but as we go into the contraction, we see an increase in the linear velocity, and this is to you know, compensate for that decrease in cross-sectional area and maintain the volumetric flow rate that we're controlling. And then as we exit the zone, um, this uh, velocity will then decrease and again become constant. So what this means is we have a different type of uh, deformation that's being imposed by moving through this channel. And so now there's a velocity gradient um, in the direction of flow, which then acts to sort of elongate or um, stretch out the fluid element. So this is in contrast to what we see um, when we're looking at just steady shear. So let me just jump back, not to confuse you, but I, I didn't really elaborate on the nature of uh, the shear rate. So just so that we can be clear about what's different in the extensional zone, I'll um, sort of fill in what I didn't uh, a moment ago. So when I talk about the shear rate as the deformation that's occurring in the uniform channel, what this is is the velocity gradient perpendicular to flow. And this red sort of um, series of arrows is just basically trying to represent the velocity as a function of position across the, the rectangular flow channel. And so you can see that neighboring fluid elements have different velocities. So that's what I mean by the gradient perpendicular to flow. And so that, that's why you generally think of um, the shearing motion. It, it's basically forcing these elements to slide past each other. Um, and so that's uh, you know, how we define that, that shear rate and what that, that means in terms of the deformation. And that's how it's contrasted with then the extensional, which is this velocity gradient. It's a velocity gradient as well, but it's in the direction of flow. And, opposed, and as opposed to having that shearing or elements of the fluid sliding past each other, now we're taking the elements and we're stretching them or elongating them. And so um, with that in mind, we're still then using the pressure drop across the channel, mainly focusing on the pressure drop across this uh, extension contraction zone. And then we're using um, the volumetric fl flow rate again in combination with the geometry of the channel to get this extensional rate and also this pressure drop across the this center zone here to get the normal stress. Because in this instance, our deformation, unlike the steady shear, is characterized by the extensional rate and what we were calling a first normal stress difference. So this is the, the, the difference between the two types of viscosities that we can offer. And what we'll find when we do some um, examples later on, one example of the extensional, is that in general fluids have a different stress response to different types of deformation. So we don't. So what we see is that the extensional viscosity is not equivalent to the steady shear. And in fact, it's, um, I would say, almost always uh, higher. Um, I hesitate to say always because I may be forgetting some exception that may exist. Okay, so those are the two main types of uh, viscosities that we can measure for you with our particular technology. And I just wanna go over some of the benefits of measuring with the microfluidic style viscometers that um, you know, could be sort of different from using the rotational type of instruments. So this is based on the nature of the microfluidics. It is small volume testing. I didn't give specific volumes here because it really depends on your test. Um, as you'll find out maybe a little more when Marina talks about our instruments and the ranges of um, that they each offer. But so sort of bare minimum, uh, depending on our instrument for testing would be somewhere between maybe 15 and 26 microliters. So that could get you a certain amount of data, but you can imagine because this is sort of the flow through design, um, you're going to need more volume, for example, if you're trying to get to the maximum shear rates, just because we need more volume to um, pump even over short periods of time. So overall, it's small volume, perhaps as low as 15 to 26 microliters, depending on the type of testing that you want. But in general, it tends to be smaller than using um, the rotational tools. Um, we do tend to operate between uh, sort of what I would call moderate to high shear rates. 
So we're not going to be able to get, for example, the 0 0.01 inverse second shear rates that you might get on certain rotational tools. We're more starting at about maybe one to 10, depending on the sample that we have. But then we can get up to, um, with our newest instrument, up over um, 1 million. I think the max we got up to was almost 5 million uh, inverse seconds and in shear rates. So we certainly have an extended um, shear rate range uh, tending towards that moderate to higher range. And we can do this without turbulence or secondary flows, which can be a problem when your geometry has a larger length scale. So that's another benefit of the microfluidics. Now, I will make the comment that although I've never actually generated any turbulence in our uniform channel, um, which is what we use to get our steady shear viscosity, we can see that a bit more frequently in the extensional channel. So you can imagine that contraction expansion zone can sort of instigate or um, encourage that type of secondary flows a little more easily than our uh, uniform channel. And of course, you, we won't have any sample loss from the tool like you might get as with the rotational rheometers. That's kind of common when you try to go to high rates that your sample will um, fly out of the, the um, plates or uh, the parallel plates or cone and plate geometry. Also, we have this closed sample environment where there's um, the, without any fluid air fluid interface that's you know participating uh, in the measurement. So this means there's little to no evaporation. So if you're um, you know concerned about losing sample for very long testing or for uh, measurements at elevated temperatures, this isn't a concern with our our tools. Also, if you have samples such as antibodies or proteins that tend to uh, migrate to interfaces because of hydrophobic domains, um, you won't have any issues with uh, interfacial contributions to the uh, viscosity in this type of tool. Um, it's purely bulk viscosity, no, no sort of artifacts coming from you know, concentration gradients that exist leading to an interfacial component. And also this is beneficial to recovery for recovery purposes because in a moment I'll mention um, how we can you know, recover your sample from our tool and then return it to you if that's um, of interest to you. And if the sample hasn't been you know, exposed to air, um, only the shear experience, then this is beneficial when we recover the sample. So less sort of perturbation or alteration of the sample due to the testing. And then a final comment uh, is that we can uh, really distinguish very small viscosity increments. So if you want to look at low viscosity samples, for example, and uh, differentiate these that are you know, minimally different. Uh, by that, I mean you know, a fraction of a centipoise, maybe a tenth of a centipoise uh, difference. Um, this can be done on our instrumentation, which I think is a little more difficult when you're using, say, the cuet or cup and bob. And so you can do things that you would normally perhaps do in a capillary tube, such as the intrinsic viscosity measurements. Okay, so just a, a quick overview of some of the measurement uh, options and analysis options that we can offer you. So um, obviously we're, we're talking here sort of steady shear and extensional. What are the parameters that we can adjust for you? And so these are just the typical ones. So we can uh, adjust all the parameters that you may um, be familiar with or that you may know that you need. So for the case of temperature, um, you know, our full range is going to be about four to 105 degrees C. Um, so we can select the tool, um, our particular viscometer, to get the right temperature range that you would need. And you can look at um, a variety of materials here, whether you're just looking at something that has a simple Arrhenius behavior um, or something more complex where you have maybe something that's thermoresponsive or that goes through some kind of phase transition as a function of temperature, a thermal phase transition, um, and also things like protein denaturation. Um, thermally induced uh, denaturation of proteins can be explored here. And um, then the obvious, of course, would be shear rate and extensional rate. So we have the ability to vary this, and I kind of hinted at the range that we can offer, at least for shear rate. And so then we can clearly identify is something Newtonian or non-Newtonian, and if it's non-Newtonian, what is the nature of that behavior? And then finally, time is also something that could be relevant to many of our customers, and, and the context of this would be more towards stability. So if your samples have a tendency to aggregate or degrade um, as they're stored or as they age, then this is something that we can monitor as well. And of course, you can do these all individually or you can bring them into combination and you know, more thoroughly characterize your, your samples. As I mentioned, we do offer um, the option to recover your sample from our instruments. 
and then return that to you. Of course, um, we can never recover 100% of the sample because we always lose a little bit to the in internal components of the instrument. But generally, we can, depending on the viscosity of the sample and um, you know how elastic it is, we can generally get back between, um, say, 50 and 90% of your sample. The 90%, of course, is more towards those lower viscosity, uh, more Newtonian-like fluids. Um, the 50% more to something that's approaching, say, 1,000 plus centipoids. Okay, so analysis tools, one of our most common um, uh, analysis options that we offer due to um, a large number of our customers being in the pharmaceutical industry is uh, the injection force analysis. So can we um, use viscosity data to predict you know, the potential delivery through injection? Um, and this can be done for Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. We, we can also help you with um, model fitting, whether that's different uh, forms of viscosity versus shear rates or viscosity versus temperature, viscosity versus concentration. Um, we can analyze the data in this way. And then another um, option, uh, as I kind of hinted at on the previous slide, is the intrinsic viscosity analysis. And so this then could be if, if you know, if it's of interest to you, um, in some instances related then to, say, a hydrodynamic radius of uh, a polymer or protein or a molecular weight of a, a polymer. Okay, so this is sort of the general high-level overview. And now I just want to give a couple um, examples of these different categories of testing um, that we offer to you. So just a quick example of you know where temperature uh, variation could be of interest to you um, and you know what types of data you might expect to see. So this is a particular um, temperature variation for a concentrated protein sample. Um, we were working with a customer who was um, typically just operating at 25C for their measurements but then what they found was uh, when they limited their measurements in this manner and they would be passing on, say, their formulation to sort of a pilot or production area where these samples were often stored cold and people would wait various times after removing them from the storage to begin using them, they found out that there was a little bit of inconsistency in handling these materials with respect to the, the viscosity data that they were collecting at room temperature. So it's a very simple thing in our, our our technology to do what we refer to as a temperature sweep or temperature variation so that you can explore what the behavior is at any relevant temperature to you. And my example here is a protein, but of course this could vary depending on your particular application. And as I stated, we could handle anything between 4 and the 105 degrees C at this time. Um, so for this particular protein sample, you know, cold storage is typically around 4 C or so. Um, you know, delivery or injection or, you know, processing um, could be at about 25 C, something close to room temperature. And then if you're interested about any, you know, changes that might occur in the body, that's at about 37 C. Um, and this line represents a simple Arrhenius fit so that um, you can interpolate if you would like to, you know, predict how this might handle at any particular temperature that's, that's relevant. And the Arrhenius fit here works fine because we haven't gone high enough in temperatures to denature anything. Okay, but we're not limited to handling just uh, that simple type of uh, temperature response. Um, our instrumentation is capable of handing, handling something that's more complicated. So I had hinted at the idea of thermoresponsive samples where you start um, deviating from that Arrhenius behavior. Um, so an example of this are um, a particular type of self-assembling polymer. These are the commonly referred to as pleuronics or um, poloxomers, I think there are some other trade names that these can be sold under, but basically it's a tri-block copolymer where we have um, PEO and PPO in the center here. So this extra methyl group making it more hydrophobic is kind of, um, so it's the center block is more hydrophobic than the end groups, the PPO due to that uh, methyl group. So that's kind of what drives the self-assembly is that difference in hydrophobicity of the different blocks. And so the one we're looking at here, this P407, um, tends to form spherical micelles. And the nature of these micelles um, and also how they interact changes with temperature. And we can see that that leads to a, a non Arrhenius type of relationship between the relative viscosity and the temperature. So you can see that there's um, 
you know, a more complicated relationship that we've, you know, captured the dependence on a weight fraction of this poloxomer in water. And, um, you know, one of the other things, as I mentioned, that we can do for you is we can start combining the temperature and shear rates. So just to continue on with this particular example for a moment, um, and now I've just picked one of those particular concentration um, viscosity versus temperature curves. And now what we can do is in this case is sort of explore at any given temperature, what is the shear rate response? How is the, the behavior um, uh, as we change temperature in terms of, uh, is it Newtonian or non-Newtonian? And so we're looking then at uh, each of these arrows corresponds to the shear rate sweep that we uh, obtain. And so when we look at relative viscosity as a function of shear rate, we can see that at 20C, as we start ramping up the temperature, it starts off as a Newtonian or shear rate independent sample. And as we increase temperature, we see this onset of shear thinning, uh, non-Newtonian behavior that kind of um, maxes out. And then as we go over the peak, it sort of then starts returning back ultimately at 70 C degree C, we're back to something that's Newtonian or shear rate independent. So you can get a, a very um, broad or detailed analysis of your sample, both those uh, temperature dependence and then the shear rate dependence uh, as well at each temperature. And of course, there are other um, types of materials that, you know, shear rate sweeps can be important. So for example, um, the shear rate dependence of a monoclonal antibody formulation uh, this particular example is a situation where we're trying to look at not only how does the MAB um, type uh, impact the viscosity as a function of shear rate, but also how do excipients, the presence of excipients um, or non-actives in the formulation, how does that impact the rheological profile or the viscosity profile? And, you know, we're looking at, you know, are we seeing differences in the, you know, the nature of the non-Newtonian behavior? So we can see that for you know this MAB type 3, for example, we can see the improvement that we get uh, in viscosity, specifically a drop in viscosity as we introduce a particular excipient. And we can see how introducing ex the excipient in the different type of MAB influences the drop in viscosity. And also, it's this is a situation where it's important to look at the broad range of shear rates because we can see that, um, you know, the this MAB3 uh, versus MAB2, uh, although they're similar in this viscosity plateau zone, the thinning behavior is quite different and the thinning is much more extreme on the monoclonal antibody three. So this is another situation where getting that broad range of shear rates as I described is, is going to be beneficial and something that we can do with our, our technology. So um, I had also mentioned that it can be interesting to look at time dependence of viscosity. So one of the common um, factors here is, you know, is your sample stable as a function of time? So here's an example of uh, looking at a concentrated uh, protein solution where we're looking at how does buffer formulation uh, impact the stability of the sample as it's stored, in this case, up to perhaps 92 days. So this is a long scale uh, testing, which we can do for you. Um, we've done uh, stability testing for customers that has uh, lasted, I think, almost a year. Um, and that could be something that we store for you or that you send to us at a particular frequency. So what do we have here uh, is the um, this gamma globulin and other PBS or PBS plus um, salt, uh, arginine, which is an individual amino acid, which is often used as an excipient to reduce uh, viscosity. And then where we've included both of those, the salt and the excipient. And you can see how the uh, viscosity um, varies from day one based on the, the different buffer formulations and then also how the aging is different and how the probably the, the best um, stability case is where we've introduced that viscosity reducing excipient arginine. The worst case is where we've introduced some extra sodium chloride into our buffer. Um, so then I think the final uh, example of data that we can collect for you is sort of looking at um, extensional viscosity, and then also having that in comparison to the steady shear rate or steady rate, uh, steady shear viscosity. And so this is a xanthan gum formulation that we've had formulated at three different concentrations. And um, we've measured both the extensional viscosity, which is this top set of curves, and that would be as a function of extensional rate, 
and the bottom is steady shear viscosity as a function of shear rate. So a couple things to point out here, as I mentioned earlier, that extensional viscosity is higher than the steady shear viscosity, which tends to be the trend that the resistance um, to this particular type of gener uh, deformation is higher. And I, I also mentioned that although I have never seen any turbulence or secondary flows in a uniform channel, um, that is something that can occur in the uh, extensional channel and will tend to manifest as an artificial thickening, shear thickening here. So I believe what we're seeing here is a little bit of um, turbulence that comes as we ramp up the volumetric flow rate in that extensional channel. So this is an example of, you know, if we want both types of characterization there for your sample, the extensional and steady shear, that's how that could look for you. So um, before I move into the consulting discussion, I just wanted to say those were just some examples highlighting the parameters that we can vary. Um, that would be the temperature, steady shear, and then we can look at you know, things as a function of time. Um, that's just a small sampling of what we could uh, you know, offer you in terms of sample testing, uh, just to give you an idea. So if you um, have different types of experiments in mind, you know, certainly contact us. We'd be happy to discuss with you. Um, you know, whether we could perform those or not. That was just meant to serve as an overview. When we get to Marina's section, she'll tell you how to get in touch with us. Okay, so now we also offer consulting services. So, um, you know, if you come to us and you want to do sample testing and you know exactly what you want, let's say you're an experienced rheologist and you know uh, what types of parameters you want to vary and how you would like to vary them, then we will just perform that test for you. But oftentimes we find that um, you know, people are, you know, sort of uh, given the task of collecting rheology or viscosity data, and it's not necessarily their um, field of expertise. So we're happy to help, you know, work with you and um, try to make sure you uh, do the right testing um, and analysis for, for, to meet your goals. So this is kind of the four components of the consulting that we're happy to work with you on. Um, the first, of course, is, you know, we want to work with you to define, clearly define what are your goals for the viscosity testing. So what is it that you're looking to um, achieve or learn from the viscosity measurements and why? So it's kind of important that, you know, we would talk to you about um, why are you measuring viscosity and what ultimately are you hoping to do with this data so that we can clearly define those goals because we need those clearly defined goals then to move on to the next step, which is designing the experiments. So, you know, one size doesn't fit all in the case of rheological testing. There's no one experiment that's going to work for all types of applications. So we need to know what you want to achieve so that we can design the appropriate experiments. And so from this, we'll create a testing plan to support these goals. Um, and as I said, um, or maybe I haven't said, but in a moment, I'll give a few examples of uh, how we can help with different types of consulting uh, cases. So once we know what experiments we want to uh, measure based on the goals, then we'll go into the practical step. So this is the case where we start, you know, creating measurement protocols, choosing particular tools, um, you know, narrowing down what types of volumes you'll need for your samples, what instrument is best. And I'll re re reiterate these in a moment with the specific examples, but it's really, we know the overall design of experiment. Now we need to get practical. How are we going to execute it? Um, so that we can get the data that we need. And then finally, once we have the data, we need to sort of properly process that data and analyze it. So this is where we, um, you know, do any corrections to the data that we need to do, um, you know, look for any artifacts in the data which could exist, and then move on to analysis, you know, if that's appropriate uh, for your particular set of goals. And so that would be sort of the final stage. Okay, so a couple more points about this consulting before we get into some examples. Um, consulting can be done, you know, for slightly different depending on whether you are a particular, um, whether you use our instrumentation or not. So we can combine consulting with uh, sample testing services. So if you don't have our instruments, we're happy to provide the consulting services and then do all of the testing for you as well. Um, or if you are one of our customers that use our instruments, but you're new to the field of rheology and viscosity, we're happy to um, work with you um, so that you can do the testing on your own. 
And of course, sometimes it could be a combination of the two if we need to do a little method development before we pass it on to, to you as a user. So we, when we move into the consulting services, we'll offer you some free initial discussion so that we can find out what it is you need and then you know, try to determine if, in fact, we can help you. Um, and then once we decide you know, that we can you know, be of some service to you in this uh, type of situation, then we can obviously establish any sort of um, non-disclosure or material transfer agreement that would be necessary if samples would be coming to us. Um, and then we'd move on to, into sort of the exploratory phase where we get a little bit more information from you. And in some instances, we'll go and do a little research on our own um, so that we can learn perhaps more about the materials you're working with um, or the application that you're working with. Um, and then after we commit to the project and we do this background review, then you know our next step would be to provide to you uh, a detailed plan so that you can review this before you know before you commit further. So we want to offer to you the details of what what we'll be doing or plan to do, and then you can give sort of the final approval, and then we can um, you know if there's recommendations or changes you'd like to make, we can work those out, um, and then we'll go into the sort of testing phase. And you know, if you're doing the testing, we'll continue to support you and provide feedback during that testing. Um, and then ultimately, we'll sort of um, come to a conclusion with to a conclusion with you know the final product, whether that's um, as you'll see with the examples, it could just be data and analysis, or it could be sort of creation of a standard operating procedure, as one of my examples sort of goes into. Um, and I also kind of wanted to mention that uh, we also can do customized training for your team. Um, this is also available. So if you have numerous people in your organization um, or across your organization that are using our tools um, or are doing viscosity testing, then we've done sort of day-long customized trainings for um, different uh, customers that we have trying to get everyone in your organization up to speed on the testing and analysis. So this is just sort of a high view of what we can offer here. So let me try to quickly go through a few um, examples. And so these are, um, I'm not you know, showing exactly how this would play out. This is just kind of a higher level uh, view of a um, consulting example. So one of these, as I mentioned, uh, one of the very common things that we converse with our customers about, uh, given that a lot of our customers are in pharmaceuticals, is can they deliver their product? And so basically is this, this is delivery method compatibility of the pharmaceuticals. So specifically injection is typically how this is done. So the goal here then, you know, is determined to be, can we use viscosity to screen samples for uh, injectability? And so, no, so in this case, you know, what we would do is work with the customer to identify the relevant delivery parameters um, that they're trying to, or that they need to, to work with. What are the confines of delivery that they need to work within? And then we'll translate these parameters to the um, measurement parameters for obtaining viscosity. So, for example, when we're looking at injection, we need to consider what is the shear rate, um, you know, in the during the injection process, so that we can properly um, create the experiments. You know, for example, viscosity is a function of shear rate, so that we're getting what's appropriate for that application. Um, so then we'd move after we've sort of you know, at a higher level designed the experiments, we'd move into sort of the details. So what are the appropriate flow channels or chips that we need to accomplish, you know, this design of experiments? Um, what's the best instrument um, that we have to get the, say, shear rates that we need? What are the best measurement protocols to properly collect data for these particular types of samples? And what sort of volume requirements might we need? So these are just some of the practical considerations that we would work with you on. And then finally, um, we need to process and analyze that data. So we'd want to apply any necessary data corrections, which we can help with. Um, Non-Newtonian data needs a correction here. Um, and then finally, choose and apply the appropriate injectability model. So this could be Newtonian, power law, generalized, non-Newtonian. There are different models that are appropriate depending on the you know, final rheology data that we've collected. OK, so a second example that's slightly different. Um, so this would be how can we use viscosity data to help us account for environmental and formulation variation and processing. So, um, so here the goal is going to be utilizing that viscosity data to predict processing, processing parameters. So for example, filling 
um, in the process in your manufacturing environment. So again, we're going to look for what, what are the relevant parameters in that process um, that we need to consider. So in this case, we're thinking about you know, variation in formulation that can occur in the manufacturing environment, because we know formulations, there's some sort of um, uh, error that's involved. Um, also, what are the relevant environmental conditions and, you know, what, uh, you know, parameters are relevant in terms of, say, shear rate during filling. So in this case, um, you know, we're thinking about there's some variation in protein concentration as you make different batches of formulations and the environment can vary um, in that manufacturing environment, say from 4 to, in this case, we've gone up to 37C um, to account for, say, cold storage to elevated temperatures, depending where you are. And so here we're looking at viscosity as a function of concentration and then temperature. Um, so then that's how we've sort of translated uh, the sort of needs of this particular application into the viscosity measurement parameters. And again, the experimental details have to be determined just as I described a moment ago, appropriate channels, appropriate instrumentation, appropriate protocols, and needed volume for these. And again, we're going to then finally you know, process and analyze this data. So in this particular case, it would be choosing and applying different models to fit to the data specifically protein concentration and temperature dependence um, to use perhaps to interpolate to get you know, your specific set of conditions in that particular environment. So what is the viscosity at a particular concentration and temperature um, when you're trying to uh, execute on this fill process? And then finally, um, you know, if you're dealing with more complex fluids, sometimes even creating a, a standard operating procedure for evaluating these samples can be a little difficult if you're not familiar with all of the details that come with some certain types of complex fluids. So the goal in this case, we want to create some kind of standard testing procedure that gives us consistent results and um, meaningful results so that we are, you know, truly screening the material um, in the way that we, we um, can think of. So by complex, there's, you know, complex fluids, it's a general statement to imply that, you know, there's a complex structure that leads to a complex viscosity response. Um, and there's, you know, countless examples of this. The piloxomer that undergoes the thermal phase transition is an example of a complex fluid. But my example here um, is something like, this is describing something like gelatin, which also goes through a different phase transition as a function of temperature. So something that has helical structures, and as you heat it up, these helical structures disappear and you ultimately go um, at high enough temperature to just coils. This can be tricky to deal with from a practical perspective. Um, and so you need to identify what are the complications um, with a particular type of fluid. So what are the particular challenges that you have with your particular type of complex fluid? So in this case, we're looking at this microstructural or phase transition and particularly the hysteresis that might exist um, when dealing with this. So you have to create a particular protocol to, or you have to create both um, not just, you know, choosing your protocol or measurement parameters appropriately. In this case, maybe looking at a relaxation time which we really haven't hinted on yet, but you might have to consider how this material relaxes. Um, but then also controlling the sample prep and particularly the, the history of the sample. Because we can see, you know, just based on this sort of generic um, behavior here that, you know, um, the history of cooling and heating can give you a different uh, level of structure and then give you a different viscosity value. And so you have to be very careful how, in this case, how you're handling the sample or prepping it and then uh, also how you're how you're testing it and then from that knowledge that we uh, get about the sample we then create the particular experimental details just as we have before and in this case there's may, may not be uh, that detailed analysis like we had discussed a moment ago but we need to sort of determine you know how are we going to uh, you know what kind of criteria are we going to have to sort of assess that quality of the data to make sure that we've chosen the right sample prep to make sure that we've chosen the right parameters, um, such as a relaxation to time to account for the relaxation process. So these are just a few examples of um, uh, 
consulting types of cases that you know, you, we may have encountered or we may encounter in the future. So now I'm going to pass it on to Marina so that she can discuss with you, you know, once you've decided perhaps that you want to work with us, either with the sample testing or consulting, she's going to talk to you about that process and a little more details on the instruments that we utilize to, to collect your data. Ah. Thank you, Stacey. Hi, everyone. Uh, so yes, I will talk about the sample testing details and how do I get started with that and the instruments we have here. So our core technology is all the same. We do use those microfluidic flow channels for every single one of these instruments I have on the screen here, uh, but we do have some nice, lovely different options here. Uh, so our uh, smallest unit, I will say, is our microvisc. Um, this instrument is portable, so you can charge the battery and take it with you to go somewhere if you do like field testing. Um, this instrument also has the small the least broad range in terms of shear rates and in terms of temperature um, this is very nice for a qc environment if you're like working on something you just need to do a quick viscosity check this is awesome for that um, the viscosity ranges goes to 0.2 all the way to 20,000 centipoise um, and in terms of sample volume it uses about 100 microliters uh, per test once the chip is primed. So you will need a little more sample to introduce your sample into the uh, microflex flow channel um, in order to get a proper measurement. Um, and down here I have some common applications that each instrument is used for. This is not sp uh, strictly what they're used for, but this is kind of what we see from our customers and what, why, why we might recommend for them to use. Um, so some common applications for the microvisc, like I mentioned already, is the QC testing and the quick viscosity test. Um, other common applications include blood, whole blood samples. Um, we do have a few customers who use these in a hospital setting, and plasma and serum is also another uh, common application for this particular instrument. Um, our next instrument we have here is the MV Rock. Uh, this instrument also has the capability to do some extensional testing, which is our EV rock. Um, basically, the instrument looks exactly the same. The only difference is the type of flow channel we're using. So if you wanted to do steady shear testing, you would use the MV rock, which has the rectangular flow channel geometry. Um, and if you're interested in EV rock, the difference is the flow channel, which would have the constriction in the middle. Um, but they're basically the same instrument. Um, that's the only piece that's different. Um, so with our MV rock, it has a high shear rate range. It could go up to 1.4 million inverse seconds, which is really cool. Um, and also the temperature range is higher. As you can see, it goes from four to 70 degrees Celsius. Um, this uses slightly less volume than our microvisc. Um, I, again, will say this is once, this is the volume that it needs to run a shear rate um, once the channel is primed or the channel already has solution introduced into it. Um, so this will be how much volume you will need to perform a single measurement. Um, and it also has the same viscosity range as our microvisc. Um, again, some common applications for this instrument is it's great for uh, research and development work. Um, if you have some new samples you want to test, um, or maybe you need a higher shear rate range, it's also great for that. Um, we also see a lot of our customers use it for like oils and lubrications and cannabis oil really viscous uh, types of samples that you have. Um, coatings is also another common application we see for this instrument. Since the system is a closed environment, it's great for testing things that might coat. Um, or other another common application uh, is paints. Paints is also very common for our MV rock and EV rock system. Um, and as I mentioned previously, our higher viscosity samples this instrument is great for. Um, our last instrument that we offer testing on at the moment is our VROC Initium 1 Plus. Um, this system is automated and it's a high throughput viscometer. So as you can see in this image here, this one has this auto sampler and a vial tray rack. So basically the auto sampler will come and grab your sample and inject it into our system. Whereas our other two instruments I mentioned, they are more manual. So you'll have to fill a syringe um, and put it in yourself and kind of monitor your experiment. Whereas with the Initium One Plus, it's a little more automated, so you could just set up 
everything, make sure you have your solvents that you need for cleaning and you're pretty much ready to go. Um, there's a little bit less of a range available on this instrument uh, just due to the way it's designed. So it goes up to 140,000 inverse seconds. Um, the temperature range is the same as the MBROF. We can go from four to 70 C. Um, another very nice uh, use for this instrument is this low sample size. Uh, the sample, a uh, low sample we can run with this is 26 microliters, which is great if you have limited sample volume or you have more of a precious or expensive sample. Um, and there is less of a viscosity range as well, as you can go up to a thousand centipoise with our with this instrument. Um, so as I mentioned, some common applications for our Initium One Plus is the small sample size. Um, again, you have very limited volume, it's a very expensive sample, it's great for that. Um, another common thing we see is antibody and RNA therapeutics and protein screenings. Um, this instrument is very popular with our biotech and biopharma uh, customers. Um, another perk for this instrument is we like to use it for intrinsic viscosity as well as protein stability. As you can see, it gets to very low viscosity ranges. All right. Uh, and here are some other applications which can be used for all of our instruments. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, I just listed the common ones that we see our customers use them for. Um, but as you can see from this list here, you can use it for a number of things such as suspensions. We have some customers in the food and beverage industry who use our instruments. Um, volatile chemicals, it's great for because again, it is a closed system. So you can kind of limit that smell or like things that evaporate. Um, we also have for like cosmetics, uh, electrolyte solutions, um, lots of lovely applications here. All right, so we're gonna get started with our sample testing if that's something you're interested in. Uh, and the process is similar for consulting. Um, so if, for example, you wanted to start with your sample testing, um, if you know your sales rep, uh, you can contact them directly and say, hey, I'm interested in either sample testing or consulting. Um, they'd be more than happy to get you started on that process. Um, if you are new um, and would still like to use these services, you can go to our website. Um, for sample testing, you will go under the service tab that I have down here uh, or marked in red. And you will go to the sample testing section and you will go ahead and click request sample testing. Um, at the moment, we do not have a specific page for consulting. So what you would do if you wanted to do consulting um, is you would go hit this contact us and it'll give you a form to fill out where you can put, oh, I'm interested in consulting. Um, you can also do it for sample testing as well. Uh, if you just go to the contact us, it's a very similar thing. You just put, oh, I'm interested in sample testing. Um, so once you do that, if you are brand new to us, uh, for the sample testing, it'll bring you to this form. Um, so you can go ahead and fill out all these, uh, uh, what it's called parameters, the best of your ability. Um, and it'll also ask you several other questions. Like if you have a viscometer, how often do you use it? There is also an option to say, oh, I don't have a viscometer just in case you don't. Um, if you're interested in one, if you are interested in one of our viscometers, uh, you can go ahead and click yes. Um, and I will make a quick comment that if you are interested uh, in a certain viscometer that we offer, you can put in the comments section here that you would like your sample tested with that specific viscometer. Um, so that way, if you want to see what the data would look like that you would generate yourself. Um, so that is an option as well. Um, and then you would uh, other areas you would fill in is like what you think your viscosity range might be for your sample. This could be an estimate. If you're not sure, you could put you're not sure as well. Uh, how much sample volume you have, um, your desired shear rates. If you have an idea about this, you can put it in here. If not, you could put you're not sure. Um, what temperature you would like your experiment at. You could put room temperature if you think your sample, you want your sample test at room temperature. Um, if you have a desired temperature, you can put that in as well. Um, if you have any knowledge of particle size in your samples, you could put that here. Um, these solvents to be used area, so this is for what we would use for our cleaning. Um, so if you have a solvent that you know your sample is miscible in, 
um, such as like IPA or acetone um, or a surfactant, you know, you could put that here. Um, if it's a, pr a protein or something along those lines, for example, you could put a buffer that you know your uh, sample is compatible in. Um, for protein samples such as that, a lot of the times we'll ask that you send us your buffer um, because we've found that is usually the best way to clean out your sample is what it's already in. Um, so if you have knowledge of any of that, go ahead and put that here. And then just some other general things about you, like your name, where you work, et cetera. And this comments section is for any other things that you're interested in, um, such as running your sample on a specific instrument. You feel free to put that in here. So if you have your sample rep or once you're contacted by a sales rep, if you went through our website, uh, they will help you uh, fill out uh, this sample request form that we use here at RioSense. Um, it's very similar to the one on the previous page. Um, this is just if you want to, if you have multiple samples, all the um, areas are the same as the form we saw on the previous page. Um, you're going to add your description of what your sample is, what you call it, some sort of identifying uh, factor. And again, everything's very similar. The sample volume that you have available that you can provide for us, what you think your viscosity range is, fluid density, uh, it's necessary for a few tests. If you don't have that, that's okay. And again, desired tests and shear rates, temperatures, particle size. Uh, oh yeah, and your cleaning solvents. If there's something you know your sample is miscible in, please uh, feel free to put that in here. Um, also, I will point out uh, there is a section here. This section on the form is for if you have special sample prep, uh, like let's say you're sending us a powder and we need to reconstitute that. Like what exactly, how would, uh, like how much would we need the liquid would we use to reconstitute it? Um, we also use this section for storage instructions, like does your sample need to be stored in the fridge? Does it need a freezer? Does Can it be set outside? Does it need to be away from sunlight or light in general, heat, um, things like that. You can go ahead and put them in this box here. And let's see, yeah. And then this is just what you would send your sample in. Um, if you have a smaller sample size, we do ask you send in a smaller volume, like a centrifuge tube is very common. We see the vial. Um, other things like if you have larger volumes, you send in a glass bottle. Um, and these are other glass vials. So you can go ahead and select these two. So it just gives us an idea of what we're receiving as well. All right. So also, if you have a lot of these, if you looked at that form and you're like, oh, I don't know a lot of these things, um, but I want to do sample testing anyways, feel free to reach out to Stacy and myself. Um, we could help you make decisions on what instrument to use, what type of testing you want to do, such as a rates, a shear rate sweep, a temperature sweep. If you want to do both, that's totally an option. How much sample you need, if you need any special storage, et cetera. Um, and if seeing, and even if it's something just to be like, oh, I have this sample, I don't know if I could run it with your guys' technology, you can also reach out to us and we could see if your sample is compatible with our technology here. All right, so once all that is settled, you're gonna go ahead and ship your samples to our headquarters. We are located in San Ramon, California. Um, so you would go ahead and send it to this address and we, once we get your samples, we will follow um, whatever was agreed upon on the sample testing form. And then once all the sample testing is done, we will generate a nice report for you. Um, I just have an example of what the report might look like on the side. So we'll include the instrument we used for testing, the chip ID, so this will be the type of flow channel that we use, the dimensions, um, as well as like uh, the type of how much pressure had on the chip, your sample, who tested it, and when we tested it. Um, it'll also include a brief summary of the testing that was done on your sample, um, and we'll include a results section as well. And usually our uh, results will include some sort of data table um, as well as a graph. Um, so this will be data 
uh, that's been generated and usually cleaned up a little bit um, to present to you in this report. Um, we do have raw data files uh, which are given from the instrument and if that is something you think you might need or you might just want to look at, feel free to like let us know. We could definitely send those with you with your report. And that concludes our presentation portion of the webinar. Uh, okay, great. Thank you, Marina. So now what we will do is uh, go on to see if there's any questions. So give us a moment to access that tab. Okay, so we are getting some questions coming in. So um, I'll take the first one, I guess, and then maybe you'll take the second. Sure. Uh, okay, so the first question is, are the chips reusable? Um, and the answer is yes. So these are meant to be, um, you know, you test with them and then you clean them um, in a way that's appropriate to your sample. Um, and then, yes, you can reuse them for, uh, I mean, we've, it's hard to give an exact lifetime for the chips, but we do have chips that are, you know, five years old, maybe even a little older internally. Um, so it's, you know, they have a pretty long life if you maintain them well. Um, so yes, they are in fact uh, uh, meant to be reused. All right, so I will take this next question. Uh, what does VROC stand for? So VROC is an acronym for our technology. It stands for viscometer rheometer on a chip, and that's going to be that microfluidic flow channel that's used um, to do our measurements. Okay, so while we wait and see if there's more questions coming in, I just uh, a couple things uh, occurred to me while Marina was speaking. So I just wanted to comment. Um, she gave a list of um, applications or types of samples that you know we've tested or we know are compatible but don't be discouraged if you didn't see your particular application or sample on her list um, please go ahead anyway and contact your um, sales rep um, because you know that wasn't necessarily a comprehensive list um, and if we hadn't if we, and if we have not yet tested it it doesn't mean that we can we're happy to look into that and give it a try if we think it's possible um, and then also um, the sample testing, it could just be that uh, you want the testing done and you know that's the end of it. Um, but also we sometimes we have um, people come in for sample testing sort of as a trial to do before they decide to buy an instrument. And so you might wanna talk to your uh, technical sales represent, representative about that option. Um, Marina and I never talk money, but you know, uh, you know if you, you know, choose to purchase um, shortly after having your sample testing. There is some sort of credit deal there for the purchase of an instrument. That's as far as we'll go on Money Talk. Um, also, I'm not sure where these questions were being um, presented to you, but I'm hoping and asking that um, if you haven't seen them and maybe they'll be delivered to you when you get the recording, um, just to remind you, anyone who signed up will get a, a email after the event here uh, with the recording and the slides. Um, also, we were trying to get some survey questions answered from the our, uh, participants in the webinar here um, because we're looking to better understand what types of applications and samples um, that you're working with and you know, also the benefits of sort of contract or outside testing to you. So I think there's about four or five questions. They're very brief and simple to answer. Um, if you have the opportunity to answer those, uh, please do. That would be very helpful to us. Um, and then just another couple uh, quick comments that I thought of uh, while Marina was going over the sample testing form. So we understand that you know if you knew your exact viscosity, you wouldn't be um, asking us to measure it. So I guess I just wanted to say that um, it's kind of beneficial. You know, if you send a larger volume of sample, we can visibly sort of look at it and gauge what the viscosity is. But if you're sending us like 30 microliters, it's very hard to visually detect there. So um, we're looking for you know. If you can't come up with a number, that's fine. Maybe just sort of a general comparison to a common material, like is it more water-like uh, or you know more like honey, something like this. Um, that that type of general thing is is very helpful. It's just going to help us 
determine what instruments to use and what kind of range we think is actually uh, uh, possible for you. So um, it looks like we've we've answered all the questions. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. And yes, please reach out to your rep or just you know fill out the contact form uh, on our website if you're interested in working with us on either consulting or sample testing. Um, and we hope to yeah be in touch with uh, um, any of you who are interested. Yes, thank you, everyone. Okay, have a good day.